The question of whether or not milk contains hormones in general, yes, milk contains hormones in general. And people always are like, oh my goodness. But you have to look at it in the context of your whole diet. Every food that you eat contains hormones to some capacity. It really comes down to what works for you and how better you can adhere to it. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I'm very, very excited to having a chat with you on everything dairy and milk. Mm -hmm. So I think this is going to be an awesome conversation. I want to ask you something very interesting and is about your background. So tell me a little bit about why you decided to be a, a dietitian in the first place and why you do what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first off, thanks for having me. Super excited to be on um, talking about one of my favorite topics. So my name is Lauren Twig. I'm a registered dietitian. Um, and if you had asked me 10 years ago, if I was going to become a dietitian, no, I had no clue I was going to end up being a registered dietitian. I really thought that I was going to be a small animal vet. That was where my heart was. A um, little bit about my background and why I wanted to go to vet school in the beginning is I grew up on a dairy farm in central California. So in the United States here, um, and I loved it. I loved growing up in agriculture. My parents do dairy farming, but then also do like tree fruit and nuts and different crop farming as well. So was really raised. Now that I look at it, I was raised around nutrition. Um, but at the time, I didn't think so. So then I went to college and I was gung ho. I'm going to go to vet school. Um, and I started to encounter a lot of myths about agriculture and a lot of myths about the dairy industry. Um, and I found myself constantly kind of correcting misinformation and trying to shine dairy in a better light or explain certain things. And that was really where my interest in nutrition began. How can I connect the dots between agriculture and people? Um, and a lot of times that's through their nutrition. So that was how I switched tracks and became a registered dietitian. Now I work as a health promotion specialist in corporate wellness and then run my own nutrition company as well, where I work with private clients on weight loss, healthy eating, mindful eating, basically whatever um, they want to do, we work on it. So it's been fun. I like what I do now. I just never thought I would be here. <laughs> That's so awesome. Why, why milk and dairy though? Why so much love and passion for that specific area? Yeah, I think because honestly, it's the one that I think has the most misinformation about it. Um, you know, there's not a lot of people who will argue about crop production and walnut production or tree fruit production, but dairy, on the other hand, there's a lot of misinformation out there about the dairy industry. And like I said, I mean, it's one that my family works in and it's one that I was raised in and I got to see with my own two eyes. And that's kind of how I honed in on dairy specifically is I just want people to always make all their decisions based on facts. Um, and you don't always get that with social media. Yeah, that's true. It's incredible how much controversy brings talking about dairy and milk on so many topics, especially related to health, uh, yeah. cancer, and how much you, how much risk you can have by having some specific dairy products, the full, the full fat version versus low fat version. Uh, right. So many misconceptions. And I think that's one of the reasons why I thought it would be a really good idea to bring you on the channel and speak a bit about all of these different myths. So I guess the first point that I wanted to touch on is what are some of the components in the milk people, uh, in the milk that people are afraid of? Is it lactose? Is this like because of the protein or dairy sensitivity? Or why would you have so much issues suggesting dairy products in the first place? Yeah, so there's a lot of things that people typically fear, I would say, or that they worry about. Um, I think the two largest ones are going to be the lactose content, obviously. Um, and the protein actually has become a big point of conversation as well. So with lactose, which is the milk sugar, um, or the sugar naturally found in milk, a lot of people have either a sensitivity or an allergy to lactose. So that makes a lot of people worry about it. Um, the, the thing that I always like to say is it's really important that you distinguish between the two of those, between an allergy and between a 
sensitivity because an allergy requires complete elimination of dairy. Um, it is an allergic response. It's inflammatory. You should eliminate dairy from your diet. But a sensitivity, on the other hand, not so much. That's just simply a digestive issue and not to undermine it, but there are different ways that you can still enjoy dairy in your diet, even if you have a lactose sensitivity. So I kind of like to add that plug, but lactose is one thing that people worry about. Um, protein is another one. You can have a protein sensitivity as well. So historically we always thought it was the sugar, um, but also some people every once in a while have an issue with the protein as well. Um, so that makes people worried. There's different ways that you can navigate that as well. Um, but then kind of on another offshoot, there's always conversations about the fat content. There's always conversations about, well, what about hormones and all of that? So there's a lot of components that people worry about that. That's why I do what I do so that we can have conversations about those components. That's amazing. Now, how, how true is that male contain hormones that affect your hormonal balance? So, The question of whether or not milk contains hormones in general, yes, milk contains hormones in general. And people always are like, oh my goodness. But you have to look at it in the context of your whole diet. Every food that you eat contains hormones to some capacity. I always say if it's had a life, it has hormones because hormones are essential to life. Um, milk is no different. That does not make the milk low quality. It does not make it dangerous, and it doesn't mean that it impacts our hormone level, but to say that there are no hormones in milk actually is not true, but these are natural hormones naturally present. Added hormones, on the other hand, there are no added hormones in the milk. Um, so I like to distinguish between the naturally occurring and the added hormones. And then there's been a lot of studies that have been done on whether or not these natural hormones impact our hormones as humans. And they found that that's not really true because first off a hormone all the way down to its structure, a hormone is a protein majority of the times. Most hormones are proteins. Our body digests proteins. It digests them. It kicks them out, you know, kind of no skin off our back. But then on the other hand, there's also this thing called species specific hormones where only certain species recognize certain hormones. So there are hormones in milk that are specific to a cow. So it goes into the human body and the human body doesn't recognize it and kicks it out, you know, because we don't know what it is. So there's been a lot of studies on this topic, whether or not um, these hormones impact our health. And it's been shown that they really do not, that they don't um, change our hormone, hormonal balance like people like to say they do. Okay, that's it. But that's very interesting. Now, I have a little, little question on that is, is there any, is there any much of a difference between the different type of animals that you can get milk out of? As far as hormones go? As far as hormones and as far as like the type of milk that you get from it. So the hormone conversation is going to be the same because just like with cows, you know, if you use, we'll use the example of goat's milk. Um, it's still coming from a living animal, right? So it's still going to have naturally occurring hormones. It's still going to have all of that present. You know, there are, every milk has different ratios of lactose and protein and different fat content. So there are going to be benefits. And to be completely honest, I'm not super familiar with all of the, all of the milk options out there, but like some people, for example, tolerate goat's milk a little bit better um, than cow's milk. However, if it's a protein allergy that you have, they do say that goat's milk is not a good substitute for those with a cow's milk protein allergy because the protein structures are the same. And there's also recently been a lot of interest in camel milk. Um, have you ever tried camel milk? No. Neither have I, but apparently, which again, I need to dive more into other species milk. Um, camel milk the protein in camel milk is supposed to be better tolerated as well, or possibly an option for those with a protein sensitivity or allergy. So, but as far as the hormone conversation goes, they're all going to have naturally present hormones. Um, the macronutrients may be slightly different in each species milk. Okay. Got it. Now, a question that I wanted to ask you is about the antibiotics. Um, generally the, the, the topic that comes across all the time is whether There are a lot of general concerns that are around poos or pus. I don't know how to pronounce that in English. Pus. Oh, pus. pus. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. pus. <laughs> And antibiotics <laughs> in milk. So how likely is this to happen in the reality when it comes to like that uh, quality control, um, like the, the level that is permitted or allowed to be considered safe before mm -hmm. it is actually released into the market? 
we'll go with the antibiotics first. So I'm speaking to the US regulations. I'm more familiar with the regulations that go on here. Um, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, they really closely monitor milk and antibiotics and it's very strictly prohibited. You cannot have antibiotics in your milk in the United States. So that makes milk the most regulated food item in the US food system. Um, when I think it's important to back up and first off recognize that antibiotics are a very expensive part of the farming industry. So one misperception that I encounter a lot is people think that farmers use an antibiotics all the time, that we just, you know, when in doubt, use an antibiotic. And that's just not true because that is extremely expensive for the farmer. So they're very sparing in their antibiotic use. They interject when an animal absolutely requires an antibiotic to remain healthy um, or has a condition or, you know, an illness that requires antibiotic treatment. Um, so I like to add that because they're, not every animal is just on antibiotics. Um, so then if you have an animal that's sick and it needs antibiotics, the farmer removes that animal from the herd so that the animal can be held separately, treated separately and monitored individually. Um, and during that time that any milk that that animal produces is not put into the main, um, milk. It's, it's all held separately and any milk that that animal an on antibiotics produces, all that milk is dumped out, discarded. So it never goes into the food system. Um, and then even after that, so that's one way that farmers monitor antibiotics in milk. So then once you add that cow, it's healthy, it's no longer on antibiotics. You add it back to the milking herd. Um, that's what the whole herd is called on a dairy, uh, the milking herd. Um, once that cow goes back into the milking herd, there's still regulatory steps that happen after that to make sure that nothing is missed, that there's no antibiotics that get into the food system. So, you know, the milk is checked at the dairy, the milk is checked at every dairy that that milk truck goes to, and then the milk is checked at the processing plant where it goes and gets pasteurized and homogenized, um, every checkpoint is checking for antibiotic residue. And if at any point any antibiotics are found, the milk is dumped out and the farmer is fined. Um, and we're not talking like a $200 or $100 fine. I mean, we're talking thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. So it's very expensive. Um, farmers take it very seriously to keep their milk safe. So the topic of are there antibiotics in milk? No, there are no antibiotics in milk, um, very strictly regulated. Then on the flip side, um, the pus conversation, I like to say antibiotics first because pus is typically a result of like a sickness, right? An illness. Um, and I think it's important to distinguish just like there's going to be hormones in milk because it comes from a living animal. There's also going to be cells, white blood cells in milk because it comes from a living animal with an immune system, all of that. However, white blood cells are not the same as pus cells. And that's where the confusion lies. People like to say that all white blood cells are pus cells and that's not true. Um, pus cells by definition are like dead tissue, dead cell fragments, all of that. A white blood cell is like a living functioning cell. So there is a difference between the two. Um, and the amount of white blood cells that are allowed in milk it's called the somatic cell count. Um, the amount of white blood cells that are allowed in milk, there's a cap. So you cannot have, and it varies by region. So I can't give specific numbers on that because it's different by region. Um, you can't go over a certain level of white blood cells. But if you are way below that, farmers can earn extra money because the milk is considered higher quality. So that's more of an incentive to keep your cows really healthy because we know that when we're sick, you know, our white blood cell count is going to go up. So if you have a really high white blood cell count in your milk, that shows that your milking herd or your cows aren't super healthy. Um, and there's different ways that farmers can go in and promote health, you know, better diet, veterinary care, maybe it's antibiotics. Um, 
in order to bring that white blood cell count down. So long story short, I like to give the, the long winded answer. Um, there's no antibiotics in milk and the pus conversation, there shouldn't be any pus in your milk either. Um, and pus is not the same thing as white blood cells. So no, no. <laughs> awesome. Now, when it comes to looking at, like, is there much of a difference now that you mentioned about the, how farmers look after the cows and like the, the quality of the milk, the health of the herd, quality um, in terms of conventional and organic, the, is there much of a difference when it comes to treating the cows and production of this milk? No. So regardless of what industry you buy from, whether it's conventional milk, organic milk, it's from a large farm or a small farm, you know, the cows are the farmer's investment. The cows are everything to the farmer. So every farmer, cows are the number one priority. Um, and they all follow strict rules on cow care. Um, there's a regulatory body that's in place um, at least in the United States, that, that ensures that farmers are in treating their animals responsibly. Um, you know, and I, I like to add to, in the organic system, no antibiotics are allowed in production, right? So you do always wonder at what point, so if an animal becomes sick in an organic system, at what point do they intervene if the animal needs antibiotics, but the farmer is not allowed to use antibiotics in an organic system, you know, you have a few options, right? But majority of those farmers are going to sell that cow to a conventional herd so that it can get the treatment that it needs. But there is always question marks from some people is how long does that cow, how long do they wait to sell it? If that makes sense. Um, but as far as animal care, the animal care is going to be about the same, you know, farmers of all kinds care about their cows. So, and then as far as nutritional quality goes, there's also been many studies done that the nutri the nutrients between organic and conventional, there's no significant difference. So, you know, to me, the topic of organic and conventional is actually a conversation about affordability and accessibility more than it's one about health and safety. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more in that with you. And I really think that there is, they, they put a lot of weight into like going organic versus conventional and like organic right. is always better quality, but it's a, it is not necessarily true. So right. I think it is very important that you highlight that sometimes it is actually more challenging to be in an organic, in the organic realm, especially if you're a farmer, because you can't use the things that you would use normally to protect your cows and right. it, or like taking less care of them by, well, or I either let you die or I just sell you to someone who can look after you better than me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you wish that, or you like to think that all organic farmers are like, oh my goodness, this cow is sick. I got to send it off somewhere because it needs the treatment and I can't use antibiotics. Um, and you, you like to think, and I'm sure plenty of them do, they're very proactive, I'd like to think, but you do wonder, what about the ones that just, you know, they don't want to, they, they don't want to sell their cows either, because the cow is their investment, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I think both can be great. I think there's question marks. Um, and the health halo around organic really is my largest issue with the mm the farming. Um, it's not healthier. It's not safer. They're both healthy and safe. Right. So, um, my issue is not with the farming practice. It's with the health halo. I agree with you. This is not specifically about dairy, but it's a follow up question that I get a lot of, uh, a, lot, a lot of questions on and is why sometimes eggs are categorized as dairy. A lot of people think that dairy, uh, eggs are part of a dairy product. Um, why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't actually know the answer to that question because they should not be in the dairy category. I think sometimes it's because it's like a byproduct of animals, right? It's a, it's a byproduct. Um, just like meat though. And just like poultry. Um, but no, eggs should not be included in the dairy section. They just, 
They are two separate things. <laughs> Have you ever been asked that question before? I've not, um, no? okay. but, I've, but I've seen it. I have seen it on certain graphics where they include eggs in the dairy category. And yeah. I always am like, mm, I wonder why, because I could see where they would put eggs, I mean, in poultry, right? But eggs should really almost be just on their, they're just on their own. Yeah, I think yeah. that they are, they're, people think that they're dairy because they put close to the, the dairy, like close to the cheeses, like when it, with the placement in the supermarket. Perhaps yeah. that's why people might think that they are, they belong to the dairy. Yeah, I could see that. I'm sure there's a variety of reasons because you always find the eggs next to the yogurt or in between the yogurt and the milk. So I could see that too. But yeah, they shouldn't be in the dairy section. <laughs> now, there's another question that um, I really wanted to ask you as a follow up, and it is about the consumption. Uh, this is about eggs. This is not about dairy, but probably you can give a little bit of a lie on this because I get a lot of questions on this as well. Eating eggs raw, is it, even if you separate the yolk, can you eat that? Is it safe um, or not? So you're not supposed to be eating raw eggs, raw milk, you know, it, it is a foodborne illness risk. So I will say that, and as a dietitian, I also eat cookie batter, right? I, I eat cookie dough and I know that that has raw eggs in it. Um, you're not supposed to be consuming raw products. It's for your own health and safety purposes. Um, raw dairy, raw milk, has really gained a lot of traction. I feel like similar to kind of the raw egg topic, um, raw milk has gotten a lot of a lot of interest lately, and it is a foodborne illness. I mean, we pasteurize milk to promote food safety. So, and there's really no nutritional difference between raw and pasteurized. So. Same thing, you know, with eggs, like drink pasteurized milk, cook your eggs, <laughs> just raw, consuming them raw in excessive amounts is not a good idea. Like, could people just like meet the cow and get the milk raw straight from the cow and drink it? Is it not very safe then? So when I recommend, Keep in mind, I grew up in the industry, right? And my family always drank pasteurized milk. We never drank raw milk straight off the dairy, but I grew up around many, many families who did. Um, I personally know somebody who was not raised drinking raw milk and then they tried to drink it fresh off of a farm um, and they got very sick, had to be admitted to the ICU, which I'm not saying that'll happen to everybody. I you know that's anecdotal um but i do think there is safety if you've been raised drinking it and if you have access to the farm and you can drink it right away um there's where there's minimal points for contamination if that makes sense um i find that to be safer but still you have that risk of consuming raw unpasteurized milk I hope you enjoyed this episode and make sure you subscribe to my channel and hit the bell button so I can provide you with more information every time I upload a video. So stay tuned and keep watching. You mean like if someone has been drinking that the whole life, probably they have built some uh, immunity to it. So your, the body recognizes that oh, this is part of the, the normal diet, whereas someone who has not drink, drank it before, then it yeah. is just a little bit of a difference. Yeah, and I, I don't really cert know why. Um, yes, I'm not sure if it's because your body recognizes it um, or if it's because it's very farm fresh, whereas people who are drinking raw milk but they live in a big city, you know, that milk has to travel, right? It's got to go from point A to point B to point C to the grocery store to your store or to yeah. your kitchen. Um, so <laughs> it could be a variety of factors, but I found that people who were raised drinking raw milk and have access to it right away um, tend to tolerate it better. But I always say 
pasteurized is what I recommend. Um, it is safer, you know, it's been heat treated. So we know that it has less bacteria in it. Um, it's really the safer food option. And what does homo homogenized mean when homogenized. we think about milk? Yeah, so homogenized is when like the fat particles have been made. I'm trying to think of a way to explain it. So they basically make the fat particles smaller and evenly distribute them throughout the milk, uh, if that makes sense. So unhomogenized milk, when it stands in your fridge, um, the cream and the liquid, the cream and the milk will separate. And that's just that fat starting to rise because fat is hydrophobic, right? So it doesn't want to be in water and milk is primarily water. So they'll separate, but homogenized milk, there is no nutritional difference between the two. Um, homogenized is just that fat that would normally separate has been made into smaller amount, smaller particle sizes and evenly distributed in the milk so that it doesn't separate when the milk sits in your fridge. Um, honestly, this is just consumer preference. Some people just didn't like the way that it looked when their milk separated from the cream. Um, and so they came up with homogenation, but it's really up to you. If you buy unhomogenized milk, you can just shake the carton as well. And that will mix all that fat back into the liquid. But homogenized is really just evenly distributed fat particles. How about can be the consumption of full fat dairy? How much is too much? Or like, since they can be a source of saturated fats um, mm -hmm. and that seems to be linked with increased LDL and cholesterol and heart disease, which, which there is a, a, an important component of research that suggests that this is uh, obviously um, something you have to consider for saturated fat intake. So how much true is in the content of saturated fat content into the into full fat dairy and how much of these can actually be linked to um, disease on the long term? There's actually a lot of research coming out on full fat dairy. Um, primarily, you know, we've always recommended switching to low fat products to help with your cholesterol management, limit the risk of heart disease, all of these things. Um, the interesting thing about dairy when compared to other animal products, yes, dairy is a source of saturated fat. There is saturated fat in it, but there are over 400 types of fat found in milk. So not all of the fat within milk is saturated fat. There's plenty of unsaturated um, and all of the chain lengths because fats are really just chains of individual fat. So it the chain lengths are different in dairy too. It's very complex, the milk fat. Um, because of that complexity and because of the other nutrients found in milk, um, like protein and all of these things, they've actually found that full fat dairy may not have as much of an impact on heart health and cholesterol health as we once thought. When I look at it, To me, it all depends on how much milk are you drinking. Um, if you love milk and if you love dairy, um, you know, I think opting for some lower fat options would be a nice way to balance that out. But if you rarely drink milk and the only type of milk that you enjoy is full fat, having the occasional glass of full fat milk, um, it's, it's, still going to have nutritional benefits. It's not going to increase your risk for these, you know, diseases. Um, and the other thing too, is they found that milk reduces your risk for cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, hypertension, all of these diseases that also impact heart health. Um, so when I look at it in that sense, I think that full fat can still fit into a healthy diet. To me, it's all about how much are you drinking? Um, how much, how, ma how yeah. many, how frequent? The, exactly. Those make the poison, I guess. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, and especially like if, if your diet is, pretty, is very low fat perhaps, and the only thing you might be having as a higher fat content might be the full cream milk. 
is yep. is probably very unlikely to cause any issues on your health anyways. Yes. Yep, definitely. And I always like to say, if you don't choose foods based on one nutrient, you shouldn't eliminate them based on one nutrient as well. So yeah. there is so much more in milk than just the fat content. And I'm not belittling the fat because I do think it's important to consume obviously in moderation. But yeah, if you have a diet that's overall fairly low in fat, I don't worry about the fat content as much in dairy. Um, also, just given how complex it is as well. It can be tricky because we think about full cream milk as being one of the most important and more, most common items people would take. But when we think about perhaps like sour cream or like cheeses, what would be your stand on those? Especially like cheese can be very addictive. I could eat a bag full of cheese <laughs> in just one seat. And for me, this is a very... A very important point to to raise because people can can have a lot of cheese in just one seat and because it's so nutrient dense but it's also very uh high fat content some quite a few of them you can right. over easy overeat it without realizing how much fat content it might have and yeah it, it could be part of your normal diet on a regular basis so what would be your response on like having things that are not necessarily milk but are dairy products that be very high saturated fat content. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So I view them the same as milk, honestly, as we'll talk about cheese specifically. So again, you know, yes, cheese is high in saturated fat and it tastes good. So it's really easy to eat a lot of, but cheese also has six essential nutrients in it, right? So there is still a health benefit in including cheese, it's a great way to add a protein to some crackers, right? And make the most of a snack. But as with everything else, as with a glass of milk or with avocados, you have to eat it in moderation. Um, and cheese is one where the moderation can be harder to practice because it tastes so good and it's easy. You know, you get a lot of calories in one itty bitty little cube of cheese. So it, you do have to be very mindful with your portion with cheese, but I still do see there's plenty of nutritional benefits that can be um, received from eating cheese as well. I agree with that as well. Now, <laughs> eat the cheese. <laughs> oh, you, you you sort of gave me green light now. I'm yeah. all about it. Okay, <laughs> now, let's move on. And I have this question that usually pops, especially with clients that, struggle with acne hmm. and the first thing that they are recommended or told by the doctors uh, or people that like oh your your grandma your mom they always sort of hear these stories and they sort of repeat it why is the, why is this the first thing that people try to tend to eliminate or want to sort of remove from the diet mm -hmm. when it comes to acne i know we are obviously dietitians and this is not necessarily um of something that is 100% related to nutrition, but is there any link associated with acne and dairy? Yeah, so I get this question a lot too. A uh, very, very, very common question that I receive. So I've looked at a lot of research about it. Um, yes, this can be difficult to answer because skin is so individual. Um, I... Let me back up. There's currently no diet and acne link. There is no direct link between a specific food and acne. That's been proven in research, um, milk included. So as far as like a definitive research study that's shown whether or not dairy causes acne, there are none. Um, there are observational research studies, which we know observational studies cannot draw a conclusion, um, but there's observational studies that have looked at low fat milk and fat free milk and have found that some of those milk products can increase oil production in our skin, which for some people may cause acne. So you're hearing a lot of sums and that's because skin is so individual, skin is so unique. Um, there's a lot of factors that play into our skin health. Maybe you drink milk, but also maybe you live a very stressed lifestyle, 
right? Or you don't get a lot of sleep or you don't eat a lot of vegetables or you don't drink a lot of water or you don't wash your face after you exercise. Like there's so many contributing factors that, which is why there's no definitive link between dairy and acne is because there's so many factors that are at play when it comes to our skin health. So the long, that's the long answer. The short answer is no, there's no direct link. However, I do think that some people, because it's so individual, I always recommend keeping a food log, keep a food log and your skin reaction. Um, if you notice that milk, every time you have a glass of milk, you wake up with acne, you know, the next day, and you no notice that on a regular basis, maybe removing dairy from your diet will help. But as far as the research stands, for this to be a blanket recommendation for everybody that the doctors give and the grandmas give and the moms say, there's no research really to back it up. Um, I feel like it's just one of those things that's been passed down as a long held belief, even though there's no research to support it. And I think the area I have heard that the most is in my clients with PCOS. And yes. I guess this is a condition that it is not necessarily very mild. It can have a lot of different things going on at the same time. We're talking about potential insulin resistance, chronic stress, um, high levels of cortisol. There's a lot of different things going on, high androgen right. levels. So sometimes they sort of think like, pinpointing to something to blame to remove it from the diet might be the option to to find a solution for symptom management but mm -hmm. obviously it is very challenging to sort of pinpoint especially with PCOS patients they are told to remove pretty much everything from the diet yes. whether it's gluten whether it is um well you have to remove dairy as well full fat you or actually you gotta go keto and remove carbs so it, it right. is so confusing so right have you ever had that sort of conversation with that, this type of patients or what sort of things you have you encounter when it comes to PCOS and these sort of, I don't know, all these advices that are sort of just basically not evidence-based and they just remove, removing everything from your diet is not going to reduce the risk of experiencing certain symptoms anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I've experienced that as well. Uh, a lot of people on Instagram or clients that I've had, you know, women that I've worked with who have PCOS. It is the first thing that doctors prescribe, get rid of gluten and get rid of dairy. And there is no evidence to support the need to do that. You know, there are so many other things that you can do or that you can address that would probably better manage your PCOS symptoms than really restricting your diet. Because if you think about it in that sense, you know, yes. Okay. So say you remove gluten and dairy, but now you're stressed about not eating gluten and dairy and you don't know what else to eat. So now you're really stressed, which increases all of your stress hormones, right? Um, something that's very characteristic in PCOS. So you know, and there's a lot of great Instagram accounts that cover this topic that I frequently, you know, refer people to, um, and they all take a similar approach. The best thing that you can do to manage PCOS is to add more, right? Add more stress reducing behaviors, add more vegetables, add more high fiber foods, all of those things. Take these approaches before you remove, 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 and cause more stress on yourself after you received a diagnosis that you have PCOS, right? Which can be stressful in and of itself. Absolutely, yeah. It is, it is a, a still um, a condition that I don't think there is much advocates for it. Mm -hmm. And even in the, within the medical industry and all the doctors, not everyone knows how to really manage it, manage it in a, with a, the best approach. And I right. think that's where the problem comes in the first place. Like the actual healthcare providers haven't got skilled properly in how to, what is best for my clients and my patients, rather than just giving blanket recommendations of eliminating everything that could be affecting your health. Right. And I think to your point, you know, 
The other thing that makes PCOS so difficult, kind of similar to the skin health conversation, but obviously a little different. PCOS is so individual. You know, women with PCOS look so different from one another. You know, it manifests itself in so many different ways and people respond differently. You can have perfectly normal hormone levels and have ovaries that, you know, are like your classic PCOS ovaries. Um, you can have other women that really struggle with their androgens, right? And their cortisol levels and all of that. And I think that's what makes PCOS so difficult is that everybody is different, which to me shows how inappropriate it is to be making those blanket restrictive recommendations. I agree hundred percent. I hope you enjoyed this episode and make sure you subscribe to my channel and hit the bell button so I can provide you with more information every time I upload a video. So stay tuned and keep watching. Now, moving back to milk, um, what are your thoughts on the relationship between, well, it, it, it is very important to tackle this one because I guess you might get it very, very frequently as well, which is about inflammation and how would dairy by itself might be related to inflammation? Yes. So this is another very common question that I get. <laughs> I basically get, you know, I get asked about acne and I get asked about inflammation. Those ones are the two popular ones. Um, so I've also looked into a lot of research on this topic because Similar to the past two topics that we've talked about, there's a lot of blanket recommendations out there. If you want to eat an anti-inflammatory diet, you should go dairy and gluten-free. Um, dairy and gluten are always the villains, right? They're always the first two to go. Um, and it's unnecessary. It's very unnecessary for the healthy individual to do. If you have a gluten intolerance, if you have celiac disease, for example, um, or if you have a dairy allergy, then milk will be inflammatory to you because it's, it's stimulating an allergic response. However, if you do not have a dairy allergy, if you are a healthy individual, the research actually shows that dairy can fight inflammation in our body. So it either has no impact at all on these inflammatory markers in our body, or it reduces them and has an anti-inflammatory effect. Yeah. Um, I always say, why remove something that's anti-inflammatory from an anti-inflammatory diet? Um, and I'm not saying that dairy is the only key to success. I think it can absolutely play an important role in an anti-inflammatory diet, but that's going to go along with other healthful foods, right? Fruits, veggies, whole grains, all of these things that fight inflammation and promote a healthy body. Um, but dairy plays a role in that as well. And it's been shown in research time and time again and a lot of new research too no i agree 100 percent. and i guess people go always with like the extreme of well milk uh, or dairy produces inflammation but like of course only if you have like it, only if your diet is only based on milk all day every day every single day right. and it's full fat and you eat cheese and you eat more saturated fat that you should obviously it's going to be inflammatory but is, is it, again, the dose makes a poison. So it is more about how much are you drinking and how much of the um, total saturated fat intake it is part of your total calorie intake. So that's right. also something you might need to consider. Now, um, mucus production and milk. Why is this especially recommended to remove when you have patients with lung disease or respiratory conditions, they are told to avoid dairy to prevent mm -hmm. mucus production. Why? So this has been a myth that has been debunked for a very long time. They have done a lot of research on this topic on whether or not dairy actually increases mucus production. And they have found it does not increase mucus production. Um, in fact, for children, you know, with if they're mucousy and maybe they have a reduced appetite, dairy can actually be a great thing to include in their diet because it's got a lot of nutrition, good calories, you know, the fat in it that kids need. Um, they found that this feeling of more mucus has actually been related to the mouthfeel of dairy. Um, dairy has fat in it, which coats the mouth. 
um, and kind of can make your saliva a little bit sticky. And that makes you feel like you're more mucousy when in reality, you're not. Okay. It, it really makes sense. That's, so, that's something that I, I try to advocate for, especially in the hospital where I work in. Uh, a lot of patients get told to just remove dairy because they have some respiratory condition and they should be reducing that to prevent mucus production. So mm -hmm. it's always I'm fighting on a regular basis. What do you think nowadays we see more people is lactose intolerant than before? So first off, there's more people. Um, just, you know, general, when you look at it, there are more people in the world. Um, I think, you know, there's that. There's a lot of, I would love to see there's a lot of self-diagnosis that goes on as well. Um, some people eliminate dairy. They say, oh, I'm lactose intolerant. Um, and so they eliminate dairy when they actually don't have an issue with lactose in general. Um, and I'm not saying that lactose intolerant doesn't exist. It absolutely does. It's very popular. Um, but that's why there's also so many lactose free and low lactose options out there. So I, I think that a lot of it is attributed to um, as well, like parents who don't bring milk into the house and now they're having children that don't get any milk ever. And so now they have a lactose issue. Um, I feel like it's kind of that cycle, but you know, lactose intolerant is common. I don't think it's as common as people say. Got some plant-based milk. Which one is most the most nutritious amongst this type of milk that are like dairy alternatives? Yeah. So I recommend calcium fortified soy milk. That is the, the most nutritionally comparable. It's actually in the dairy section. Um, typically it, it's nutrition profile is very comparable. I also think that pea protein or sorry, pea protein, pea milk, um, is not, it's got a good protein content. Um, so that one's not as bad. Calcium fortified soy milk is my go-to. It's very important that if you choose a milk alternative to pay attention to the food label, because all milk alternatives are not created equal. What do you think about almond milk? Almond milk. Oh, so to me, it's flavored water. You know, it, it doesn't have a whole lot going on in the nutrition panel. Yes. You can get calcium in it. Um, it would not be the one that I would choose. So it has no fat, hardly any protein, very, very low in calorie, which can certainly play a role for people who are trying to enjoy a fun drink, you know, like a latte or something, and they want it to be calorie controlled. It certainly can play a role in a calorie controlled diet. Um, it just doesn't have a ton of nutrition. So it wouldn't be the one that I would choose. Oh, I have two more questions and I really let you go. And this okay. is, this probably can, maybe might not be your area, but probably you've heard of this before. Um, in fat loss, especially maybe in the bodybuilding, uh, in bodybuilding athletes, mostly run events or show days, we, why some athletes are told to cut dairy to get the skin look thinner and smoother? It says because of less water retention, less lactose. What would be your thoughts on this? So I'd actually love to hear what you, if you've looked into it, because I have never heard this before. So I researched it. I looked it all up um, and I came up with people do it because of the sodium content that a lot of dairy foods are higher in sodium, which causes water retention. Um, as far as like fat loss, dairy has been shown to help with fat loss and preserving muscle. So in the bodybuilding world, I would see where it would actually help meet their goals. Um, but prior to shows, I was reading that they do it because dairy products are higher in sodium. Yeah. Curious if you found anything. <laughs> so I have come across quite a few situations where they are told to reduce dairy but i think because of the there are different reasons and one of those is because they try to eliminate sugar as well and the lactose because it might bring for me it is more the the risk of getting for them getting bloated before the show uh having some gut issues just before jumping on the stage 
rather than sense. the actual fact that the, there's going to be water retention because sometimes actually just before the show they are they have to load a, a, a large amount of carbohydrates and sodium at the same time for them to look bigger and this the, the muscle to get pumped and get a fraction of water and everything get into the muscle so they, okay. they can look flat so yeah. it is it is controversial that's why I, I, I wanted to know your thoughts especially from the dairy itself like if you had any any idea why this this is always some a recommendation for me I would say try to, to go with the, the, the foods that you are familiar with that you know they're not going to cause any any discomfort especially with it with your GI because yeah. you don't want to be bloated if you especially you have to show up pretty much naked right the audience and be <laughs> yeah. bloated because of that so I guess for me the recommendation of reducing dairy would be potentially close to the lactose content uh, rather than the actual sodium content but I don't know there's the I think it is the old bro science that they thought well if you want to look really lean and your skin to show very smooth and thin like it is the layer of your skin is very close to your to your muscle you have to cut dairy but the actual thing of this is that perhaps this these athletes haven't been lean enough that hmm. they don't really look that that good so probably yeah. Yeah. The, the problem is that they are not as lean as they should have interesting yeah i had never heard that before so i was looking and i I saw that it's not as popular now as it used to be, um, but I came, I, I came to the sodium, but the lactose also, that makes sense to me as well. And yeah, don't play around with foods that you're not familiar with right before you're about to go on stage. <laughs> 100%. Now, future projects, Lauren, tell me any, uh, you mentioned about your group coaching program. What else yes. are you cooking on instagram i'm starting a whole label series going over what do the food labels mean and when i say labels i mean organic grass-fed pasture-raised natural clean all of these popular labels that we see all over our food and nobody knows what they mean so that's my next project for instagram um it should be a fun one i'm excited about it because i think people are confused with what's on their food right and what's in it that's really great. And I think it is going to be really good to, to start showing the difference in different labels and why, what they're like reading the ingredients really mean. Sometimes people get confused about all these ingredients and right. whether they should be scared of them or just it's part of the, the food label. Like you, right. this is not the more ingredients you have doesn't mean like it's a bad for you. Mm -hmm. Right. Or if you can't pronounce it, you can't eat it. <laughs> you know, there's lots of vitamins and minerals in food that people can't pronounce. <laughs> I agree. hundred percent. I'm so grateful that you came onto the channel. Thank you so much for your conversation with me on all of these amazing topics. Um, what would be your best recommendation or like a take home message for anyone who is watching today, this mm -hmm. program? about milk, dairy, what should they take home from this conversation? My biggest recommendation and biggest point is if you want to include dairy in your diet, milk, cheese, yogurt, whatever dairy product, it can absolutely fit into a healthy diet, despite what the popular message is in the media. Um, if you enjoy it, you can include it. And if you have questions, you should absolutely reach out to myself or to another farmer um, and actually get your information from the source and not from the media or people who have no experience with dairying. I agree. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank this you. A great message. Thank you so much for having me on. No worries. I am very, very grateful that you came. So thank you yeah. so much for your time. Thank you so much for being watching. I appreciate you so much. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you have any questions or any comments, please comment below and I'll be sure I'll answer to this as soon as I can.